Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I haven't seen Judy in, gosh, it must be what, 15, close to 15 years. And uh, through happenstance, she, she's going to be coming over to the U.S. next month, and, and uh, uh, we reestablished contact, and I said I was coming to London, and that's how all this happened. So thank you, Judy, and thank you, everyone, for arranging this and making this possible. As Judy mentioned, I'm suffering from a very bad cold, and um, I know we're going to have a coffee break later. I may need at some point a coughing break, so you'll have to bear with me, but uh, I'll do the best I can. So uh, I understand that we're going to have, uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak to you twice uh, during the course of the day. So this morning I'm going to focus on the topic of empowerment and making empowerment real. Uh, I was very, very pleased to listen to the, to the opening presentation and I jotted down some notes because it seems like uh, from what Dr. Davis was saying, Bromley has uh, been involved in this process for a long time and has come a long way and is probably ahead of uh, many other districts. So uh, what I'm telling you may not be new and may seem very familiar to you and uh, if that's so, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is um, empowerment, uh, making it real. We're going to talk about what empowerment is, give you some kind of a definition that we've worked on um, in our work at Boston University, uh, why empowerment is important, and then uh, if we have agreement that it is real and it is, it is uh, an important thing to bring about, then how do we make it happen? How do we operationalize it and uh, make sure that, that the services that people use um, are empowering? Um, we actually did a study at Boston University a few years back uh, to, uh, number one, define and number two, measure empowerment. And in order to uh, measure it, first we had to come up with a, a working definition. Um, because we found that a lot of people were using the word empowerment in so many different ways that it, uh, in many ways, it had kind of uh, become a meaningless term. It was uh, being used, uh, in many cases, to kind of... Um, say that people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that they didn't need uh, uh, help, and if you needed help, you weren't empowered. And that, to us, that was, that, that was not at all where we wanted to, uh, to go with empowerment. We looked at the uh, group of people who have been defined um, as um, chronically mentally ill or having been diagnosed with serious mental illnesses um, as lacking empowerment, by which we meant a sense of having control of their own lives. And we saw that as very much a product of a lot of traditional mental health services. Um, in, our, in our study, we came up with a, a, a multi-pronged definition of empowerment. And uh, among the essential elements of empowerment uh, were, were having control over one's own life, uh, something that we felt was, and we saw, was, was lacking in many people who uh, uh, were uh, diagnosed with serious mental illnesses and were using traditional mental health services. They didn't have any say over what kind of services they got, whether they uh, uh, needed to be in a hospital, whether they needed uh, various kinds of support. And it was always someone else defining for them, you're at this level, this is what you need, you're at this level, this is what you need, and not so much asking them, what do you need, what will help you, uh, what, what gets in the way, what, what, uh, what makes you feel better, what makes you feel worse. So people had really lost control over their own lives and their own decision making. Uh, another element um, that was very important in empowerment was people believing in themselves. And again, we saw that when we talked to people who uh, uh, have serious uh, um, uh, mental health uh, diagnoses and who have been spent many years in the mental health system, uh, that people had really lost that sense of belief in themselves. They really um, uh, always were turning to, to other people, to, to service workers or to family and saying, well, what, what should I do now? I don't, I, if you ask people to make choices, even pretty simple choices, they wouldn't know and they would sort of throw it back onto, onto the worker, well, what should I do? But as people became empowered, we saw that they, they developed a, a growing belief in themselves and their ability to make choices and make good choices. So having, being able to make choices, and in order to make choices, having information. Uh, I was interested um, that you said uh, that, that uh, you went to people in the hospital and asked them, well, where do you want to live? Um, and I know we found in the United States that when you do that with people who've been um, hospitalized for many years, they don't know where they want to live because they don't have the information 
to make those choices. So a, choice, a question of where you want to live is meaningless unless you can show people, well, this is, this is, these, these are the various kinds of housing that are available. These are the various neighborhoods you might live in. Uh, help people evaluate what's important to you. Do you want to be near a bus line? Do you want to be near a, um, uh, a movie theater or a library? Uh, do you want to uh, uh, live in a, in, a, in a densely populated city or do you want to live in a more suburban area or a more rural area? Um, do you want to live alone? Do you want to live with other people? Helping people, giving people the, a, a menu of options and helping them understand what those options meant and not just say, okay, we're going out of the hospital, now where are you going to live? Uh, because they, if, if you don't have the information, you can't make choices. And choice has to be not just about A or B. Uh, as my, uh, my dear friend and, and, and activist Ray Unsiger used to say, uh, uh, it's not like a Chinese menu where you can get to choose one from column A and one from column B. I don't know if your Chinese menus are set up that way in this country, but they are in the States. And she always used to say, well, maybe you don't even want Chinese food. So you have to have a real range of, um, of choices to choose from uh, that cover the gamut and that include things that, that other people might not think are the best thing for you if you think they're the best thing for yourself. If somebody wants to live alone, for example, and uh, someone else is saying, well, you shouldn't live alone, you get lonely. Um, and, and they can evaluate what's important to them uh, and make the choice that feels right to them with, with advice from others, with consultation from others, but ultimately making their own choices. Uh, another very important factor we found in, in, in our empowerment research was people having a sense of hope. Uh, and again and again, uh, people talked about how important it was uh, to believe that, that there was a possibility of real change in their lives. Uh, to us, hope meant that people could envision that um, three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, and further on, they could see the possibility of change. They had a point that they were at and a point where they wanted to be in the future. And if you don't have hope, every day is just exactly like the day before. And there's no, you don't see any way out, you don't see any possibility of changing. And uh, uh, hope for the future uh, was a very important element uh, in our model of what we meant by empowerment. Uh, once we um, defined empowerment, we actually set out to measure it. And we developed a 27-item questionnaire, which we used uh, in our research and which has since been used in a number of other uh, research projects. And I'm seeing a nod from uh, back there, so uh, I understand you're using it here, which is wonderful. And actually, I've, I've been uh, set, uh, working on planning a conference um, a research conference and uh, looking at a lot of instruments that are being used um, right now in recovery and they've incorporated, some of them have incorporated our scale, which is really nice to see. So we actually uh, found, did determine that, that empowerment can be measured, that empowerment can be um, um, given a, a, um, a, a quantitative uh, number and, and that when you test people over, we, we unfortunately in our studies, although other people have since used the instrument differently, we didn't have the opportunity to, to, uh, to test the same people over a period of time. But other people have since uh, used our instrument and measured that as we can change the kinds of lives people are leading and as we change the kinds of services people receive, that their empowerment scores actually do increase. Uh, empowerment is a multi, as, I, as I've described, is a, is, is a multi-faceted concept. And empowerment can, uh, can come even before real change happens in your life if you develop this sense of hope and develop this sense that, 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 that life is possible uh, to change. And one of the examples I like to give from the United States um, are the uh, migrant uh, farm workers who were very, or, and continue to be a very, very disempowered group with, with very little uh, uh, control over their lives and, and living in, in, in very, uh, extreme poverty and, and, and uh, working in terrible conditions. And um, some years ago, there was an organizer in California of the, of the United Farm Workers, C C Cesar Chavez, who uh, brought together people into a, uh, into a union. And um, their, um, their project was called uh, The Cause, La Raza. And people joined this union at great peril because they were being blacklisted, they were being uh, prevented from, from, from working by the, uh, by the growers, 
uh, if they were, if they joined the union. Uh, and yet they saw that in coming together there was strength, and ultimately the union has brought about a lot of changes in, in, in their lives, uh, increased pay, better working conditions, and so forth. But even before those changes happened, the fact that people were part of this cause, were part of this group, and saw that, that they could make a better future for themselves, they were becoming empowered even before they changed the actual conditions of their lives. Uh, so that empowerment, uh, the sense of empowerment then feeds on people's ability, then feeds people's ability to be stronger and to make changes. And this is, this is a, an ongoing process. It, it, it's, a, it's a synergistic process so that people who feel empowered are better able to articulate their needs, are better able to speak up for themselves, uh, and therefore can begin to change the material conditions of their lives and therefore become gaining even increasing sense of empowerment and so forth. So it's, it's a process that builds. We also found that empowerment has both an individual and a group dimension. So we talk about people being empowered as individuals, um, using the example of people um, who use mental health services. People are empowered as individuals if they have negotiating power about the services they, that they receive, if they have the ability to, uh, to say what they want and don't want in services and, and, and get the services that they want and not get the services that they don't want, if they have the power to um, criticize uh, workers that uh, may not be helpful to them and, and, and be able to change the people you work with so that you're working with people uh, who you feel are, are genuinely helping you. But we also see this, this power of, of uh, uh, group empowerment, that empowerment has, has, has the group dimension of people joining together. And that's why, uh, as I said, for 30 years I've been involved in uh, organizing among uh, ex-patient or consumer or survivor or user, whatever term you want to use, uh, groups in the United States, because changing things as an individual is important, but changing things as a group is also important. Uh, making it so that people who use mental health services are coming into a, in, into a service system which recognizes empowerment as important and recognizes choice as important, and therefore doesn't lead people down this, this path of, 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 of becoming extremely disempowered just so that we can begin to empower them again. But so that people, when, 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 when people organize together and work together as a group, uh, then we can begin to change the way service systems themselves actually operate so that hopefully people coming newly into the system won't face some of the things that, that we've had to face in the past. So uh, if we have an understanding then, I hope, of what by empowerment, then how do we produce this sense of empowerment in people who are um, experiencing mental health difficulties? Um, when, we, when we look at what happens to a person when they are um, experiencing these kinds of difficulties, let's, let's say somebody who's experiencing them for the first time, um, and has a, uh, it's a sense of, of losing control of your life, you don't understand quite what's happening to you, you don't know why it is that you're feeling so badly, and you often don't know where to turn for help. So you produce this great sense of, of, of helplessness and, and disempowerment. Um, ideally, as somebody finds their way to, to, to mental health services, if that's what it is that they need, uh, they would be able to work with people who spend a lot of time helping them to understand what's going on, what their needs are, um, what's happening in their lives that, that, that is uh, uh, leading to such a, an enormous sense of distress, and what things will help, and, and, and what will help is, is a broad spectrum of things. Um, it's important to not just look to mental health services themselves as solving all of the, uh, the needs that somebody has when they're in a state of acute distress. As, as Dr. Davis says, that we have to look at not just providing mental health services, not just providing the right medication, not just providing some counseling, but looking at where do you live? Are you satisfied with where you live? Are you living in a safe environment? Um, for, for, let's take a woman, for example, who's living with domestic violence. You can give her all the medicine and all the therapy you want, but if she's going home to a situation where she doesn't know if she's going to be beaten up or killed, uh, she's not going to... Uh, uh, overcome the, 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 the extreme distress she's feeling, which is coming out of genuine circumstances. So we have to look at, do we need to get you into a different living situation? Do you need protection? Do you need uh, 
uh, help from the police. We need help from social services. We have to look at people's financial situation. Do you have enough money to live on? Do you have enough, enough food to eat? Um, again, just looking at their mental health needs in isolation is never going to help them to be empowered. It's never going to help them to get over their, their level of distress. Mental health services traditionally have been organized in an extremely disempowering way. Uh, they've been based on, on involuntary treatment, long-term hospitalization, a lack of consent, uh, the lack of choices that people have about services, and um, unfortunately a very routine kind of disrespect that people are are uh, subjected to, not just in the mental health system, but, but in, in general medicine as well, where people are, are seen as, as, as malfunctioning body parts rather than as, as whole people. Um, and uh, uh, I know a common doctor joke in the United States is, is, is that you know one doctor, uh, the doctor, two doctors meet in a hospital corridor and uh, to discuss an interesting case, and they say, well, have you, have you seen the kidney in room 11? Well, that kidney is attached to a human being, and that human being has to be looked at as uh, uh, not just a, a malfunctioning kidney, but a malfunctioning kidney in the totality of, of, of his or her life. Um, and I think that, that uh, in mental health services this becomes even more extreme because a lot of mental health professionals have been trained to think that anybody with a uh, severe mental illness diagnosis is incapable of understanding or knowing what, uh, what's going on or what they need or what's helpful or what's not. Um, so that we find many mental health services in which people are just not treated as adults. They're not given genuine choices, or you go into day programs where people are doing things that uh, um, we might expect kindergartners to do, but not adults, um, where people are not given the opportunity to, uh, uh, to go on with their education or to um, have meaningful jobs. Um, there's, a, there's a lack of privacy very often, not just in hospitals, but in many uh, residential programs where uh, uh, staff routinely will walk into patients' rooms, I shouldn't even say patients, but into, into residents' rooms, um, or will go through their possessions, or will just, uh, or, or they don't have privacy to make telephone calls, they don't have privacy to engage in, in, in consensual uh, um, uh, sexual relationships. Um, and another factor, uh, that contributes to this sense of, of disempowerment is the stigma and discrimination that people face when they have a, a diagnosis of severe mental illness. Um, it's believed by, by the overwhelming uh, majority in society that people who are diagnosed with, with uh, particular schizophrenia, but pretty much any mental illness, are dangerous, um, are uh, not to be trusted, are um, unpredictable, are incapable of uh, managing their own lives, and I'm sure that the newspapers here are just as bad as the newspapers in the United States of, you know, headlining, uh, uh, you know, schizophrenic kills two people, um, but never putting in the paper, you know, schizophrenic graduates from college or schizophrenic uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, head of a, of a company or things like that, and yet people with severe mental illness diagnoses, and I'll talk about this later in the, in the, when I talk about recovery, uh, are out there doing all kinds of, of useful and valuable things, but uh, uh, people don't realize it because uh, um, it's, it's hidden, and, and uh, people don't go around saying, well, I have a diagnosis of schizophrenia if they want to get ahead in life. So those of us who have recovered from mental illness are not visible to the society, and that perpetuates, I think, a lot of the stigma and discrimination that we face. So those are the problems, and I think we're all very familiar with the problems. And then the question is, um, how do we bring about changes and make empowerment a real factor in people's lives? And I think the very first thing to recognize is that uh, people who've been diagnosed with severe mental illness have to be recognized as speaking for ourselves. Um, we are capable of articulating what our needs are. Uh, and those, uh, that, uh, those expressions have to be uh, recognized. And again, this has both an individual and a group dimension. We're capable of, of speaking for ourselves in terms of um, describing our own distress and describing what helps and what doesn't help. 
and were capable of forming groups and organizations to speak up about the broader issues of, of the services uh, that we need and the supports that we need. Um, when people are in states of extreme distress, sometimes it's very, very difficult for them to articulate uh, what the problem is. But that doesn't mean that we should just ignore them or just go blindly ahead and, and say, oh, I know what's wrong, I know what's going to help. Uh, we should help people to, um, to have the time and the space and the tools uh, to be able. Uh, and sometimes this takes a great deal of time and a great deal of patience, and often services are very stressed and, and, and focused on getting people in and out in a hurry. So it, it's maybe much harder in the short run, but in the long run, I think it will help uh, everything to run more smoothly if we really help the person to articulate uh, what, their, what their problems are, what they're feeling, what their needs are. And one of the best ways to do this is through peer support, which um, I see from the presentation earlier. I think you have built in quite well to your services here, and, and I'll talk about more uh, during the afternoon session. Um, one of the uh, tools that we found uh, that is very helpful for people um, who undergo periods of, of, of distress but function well in between times is to help people uh, make up their own care plans. Uh, so that somebody will be able to say, well, here's a situation that, that's happened to me in the past and that I recognize as a precursor to me really going to a very bad state. So if I'm doing whatever, if I'm staying up all night, or if I'm beginning to talk about certain topics kind of obsessively, here are the things I've found in the past that have helped me. And here are the things that I've found in the past that haven't helped me. And people might specify, for example, that they might need some medication for a while, a particular kind of medication. Here's what's helped in the past. Oh, but when they gave me something else that didn't help, that made things worse. Or they may say they want they need to be in a very quiet place, or they may say they need to be around people, or and everybody's different in what their needs are. So if you can help people to articulate their own care plan and then put that into effect when they're beginning to go into a, a, a bad state, this can often avert it becoming much, much worse. Um, and again, this has to happen both on the individual level and on the, um, on the group level so that we make sure that the services themselves uh, are helping people to, to, uh, um, to articulate what their needs are, helping people to meet those needs, and helping people to, um, to find what, what works for them and what doesn't so that the services themselves uh, treat people in, in, in an empowering way. Um, on an individual level, services should always be making sure uh, that users are involved in their own care um, and that users have the opportunity to evaluate the services that they're receiving, saying that this is helpful, this is not helpful. For example, in the United States, um, because, largely because I think of, of, of feedback from um, people using uh, day programs, which are widely seen to be a big waste of time and very uh, infantilizing, we're beginning to close down the day programs and help people get into education and employment that leads them towards, towards real lives. So that when people are critical of the services that they're receiving, there has to be a willingness on the part of, of, of managers and, and payers to actually see, make, see, make changes in the service, and not just cosmetic changes, but genuine service changes. Getting people out of group homes and into independent living. Getting people out of dead-end day programs into um, education and jobs. Um, and I think also very important is an opportunity for service users and service recipients to be able to step out of the role and to be able to, to see one another as fellow human beings who struggle with their own issues. It's not like people who have a diagnosis are always unwell and people who don't have a diagnosis are always well. All of us struggle with issues and all of us struggle with uh, um, difficulties at various times. And to be able to encounter one another as human beings and to, to recognize that there's a commonality among all of us. And that some of us may have experienced more extreme states than others. But they're not qualitatively different from what everybody's experienced at one time or another. And at one time, and I think still continuing, it's considered among some professionals extremely unprofessional to reveal these things about oneself. But I think that's changing and that when a uh, person who's, who's um, uh, experienced uh, severe mental illness understands that, that, that other people who've never been diagnosed or labeled 
uh, have had some elements have, at times of what they've themselves gone through. Um, it's very, very helpful. And indeed, there are now a growing number of professionals, certainly in the United States, who themselves are recovered from, from their own serious mental illnesses and who use that and reveal that fact to their, uh, to their clients and patients as part of an empowering process. That you, just because you are right now in a very extreme state that seems like uh, you're never going to get out of it and your life is never going to be better, it really helps to understand that this person in front of you who's the professional, who's the expert, um, has at times in their own lives uh, been diagnosed with severe mental illness. And it makes recovery a very real and genuine concept for people. Um, another practical step in making sure that services are empowering um, is to provide employment opportunities for people uh, within the service, in addition to helping people who want to get jobs in all other fields of life, because not everybody wants to work in mental health. There are actually other things out there besides mental health. But for people who are interested um, in helping others, um, there should be employment opportunities at all levels, um, whether the person has a, an advanced degree, degree and can be employed as a uh, uh, psychologist or a nurse or something like that, or whether the person is just has practical experience and can be employed as a peer supporter. There need to be roles for people, paid roles for people, who genuinely want to give back to others. Um, and the other uh, factor that I think is very important in making a broad range of service op empowering service options available to people is to um, support the development and the operation of uh, user-controlled services. Um, that can be anything from peer support groups, uh, to uh, drop-in centers, to uh, housing programs that are run and controlled uh, by the people who are using that service. And our uh, center in, in, uh, in Boston, the Ruby Rogers Center, is just one example in the United States of a user-run service in which we are given uh, money out of the State uh, Department of Mental Health budget uh, to serve uh, upwards of 150 people living in the community um, who are uh, in many cases not working, who are uh, functioning well enough to, to live outside hospitals, but not functioning well enough to uh, um, go out into full-time employment. Um, and through this uh, self-help approach, um, over the last, uh, what's it been, about 15 years now, uh, we've uh, seen hundreds and hundreds of people come through the Ruby Rogers Center, usually for a period of several years before they begin to move on to, to other things in their lives. Um, and user-run services should be a part of the spectrum of services that are available uh, to people um, in a uh, um, uh, fully uh, uh, operational mental health system. And user-run services are kind of frightening to a lot of providers because they think, well, if people use uh, um, uh, peer support services, they're not going to come to professional services. And what we find uh, when we look at people, there have been a number of studies in the United States of people who use peer support, um, is that it runs the range. Some people use peer support only. Um, some people, most people use a variety of, of, of peer support and professional support. And there are some people who don't even want anything to do with peer support. They just want to go to professionally run services. So it's a spectrum. Um, I hope that's an overview of, of empowerment that will be helpful to you. I'd like to give you a resource. Um, as Judy mentioned, I um, work with an organization I helped start um, um, about uh, 10 years ago called the National Empowerment Center. And we have a website that uh, uh, provides lots of information about our uh, model of empowerment, the services that we offer, but also uh, a number of articles about empowerment and self-help, and many, many uh, links uh, that, uh, if you're interested, will provide you with hours and hours of, I hope, very useful reading. So it's www power to you, it's P-O-W-E-R, the numeral two and the letter U, power to you dot org. And if you uh, go to our website, as I said, you'll uh, uh, find many uh, uh, articles um, and uh, we have up there our, our um, um, services, our publications, and uh, links to uh, many organizations. Uh, that provide uh, information about self-help, empowerment, and recovery. 
Um, and as you mentioned, um, I have my book, uh, which is called On Our Own, uh, which was originally published uh, um, way back at the, uh, in the late 70s, and we just published another edition of it. Uh, and one of the things that kind of makes me a little sad is that when this book was published uh, in 1978, um, I was hoping it would be kind of out of date by now, that things had, would have moved so far that, that we didn't need to look at uh, um, uh, why we need to make changes in the mental health system. But unfortunately, too many people tell me that it's, it's still very, very valid today. So it's an indication of how slow progress is in this field and how far we have to go in order to make sure uh, that just because you have um, uh, a serious mental uh, diagnosis of serious mental illness or are suff suffering from, from extreme distress doesn't need to mean that you lose control of your life and that you uh, uh, become a, a second-class citizen. Uh, but instead means that, that you'll get the help that you need uh, so that you can move on in your life um, and can go on to, uh, to live your choices and fulfill your dreams. Thank you. There's group uh, peer support, where people meet together in groups to discuss their experiences. Uh, there's peer support in the form of setting up self-help um, um, uh, user-operated services. Um, it's, a whole, it's a whole range, but it's based on um, basically accepting that there's, there's, there's different models of, of, of expertise and different models of helping. Um, in, um, in the West, we tend to um, value academic knowledge. We say, oh, this person is a, a, an MD, or this person is a PhD, or uh, they, have a, they have a degree, they have a title. Uh, they must know a lot about this subject. And we tend to, to devalue experiential knowledge, the knowledge that comes from having lived uh, a set of experiences. And actually, both these forms of knowledge are very important. And we need to build up the, 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 the value that we give to experiential knowledge. So that someone who's been through uh, experiences of severe emotional distress and who is now um, doing well is often in an excellent position to understand what somebody else is going through on an experiential level. That a person who's never experienced that may know something about it from, in terms of, of what they learn from textbooks, <coughs> what they learn from, from seeing clients, but they don't know what it feels like on a, on a, on a gut level. So the peer support is, can be enormously helpful to people, especially uh, because at times when people are undergoing severe emotional distress, uh, two of the most common things, and I've talked to hundreds or probably thousands of people in, in, in the work and the research that I've done, two of the most common things that people feel is that no one else in the world has ever experienced this, and that no one could possibly understand. And, and it, it, it is immeasurably valuable to someone to be told, yes, I have experienced this, and I'm doing okay now. Um, I know in my own um, worst periods, and I was diagnosed with, with uh, schizophrenia in 1966, and I was told at that time that I'd probably spend my whole life in a hospital. Um, I know that that, that that feeling of no one else has ever undergone this is, is so powerful and so crushing and so leads to so much despair that when I look back on it, I just try to imagine what it would have been like if somebody had come up to me and been able to tell me about their own experiences of that um, and how it would have felt so enormously uh, uh, relieved a certain kind of stress because when you think that no one else in the world has ever undergone your experience and you think nobody can really help you. Um, uh, Dan Fisher and I, Dan Fisher is a, um, 
a psychiatrist who's also been a patient, also been diagnosed with schizophrenia and recovered. He and I are the two of the founders of the National Empowerment Center. And Dan Fisher and I are, um, um, have written, been writing some writing, and one of the things we envisioned in, in, in the stuff we've been writing recently is that a person who's undergoing um, their first episode of, of severe distress and is being admitted to a hospital or being admitted to whatever kind of emergency services they're, they're being uh, brought into, that one of the first people that would, they would encounter in that process would be a peer supporter who would be somebody who would introduce themselves as somebody who had been in that kind of, of acute distress and who, had, who was recovered and who would be with them through the whole process of being admitted to a hospital or, or, or being um, uh, introduced to whatever services they're receiving um, and be there to explain, be there to uh, answer questions, be there to reassure, be there, just be there to be with them because uh, for those of you who have been admitted to, to hospital and not, not, not necessarily in a psychiatric hospital, any hospital experience, it's very frightening, it's very alienating, there's all these busy people bustling in and out and asking you uh, questions and, and, and uh, um, not very probing questions, but questions like, you know, what's your name and, and where do you live and, uh, uh, you know, what, what hurts or whatever, but not, not being there with you as, 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 as a full human being. So if somebody was there with you throughout this process and, and, and really helping to to, to explain what was going on and really there, be there to reassure and, and, and to comfort, I think it would make an enormous difference for somebody who's, who's in a very acute stage. Um, but peer support is also for people who are um, in the process of recovery. Um, it's excellent for people, for example, that are going out to work for the first time in a long time. That, that's very stressful for anybody. Um, to have the opportunity to meet, meet in a group, perhaps, with other people who are just going out to work and other people who've been doing it a little longer so they can talk about questions like, uh, you know, do I, uh, do I disclose the fact that I have a psychiatric history? What are the advantages and disadvantages of that? What do I do when I feel stressed? What are good stress relievers at work that I can integrate into my work day in a way that's normalizing, that's not going to set me apart, but that will help me to, to get through the day? Um, or people who are just beginning to live in their own apartments, you know, getting together and talk about very practical things. What do you do with all this laundry? And, uh, um, you know, what do you, uh, uh, how do I shop for and cook nutritious food? And, and um, how do I manage my money? So peer support runs across the whole gamut. Um, and it's, uh, um, again, for some people, uh, in addition to whatever professional services they may be receiving, for other people, may be all that they need at that time. About, uh, we, you say carers in the United States, we say family members. Uh, we say carers here, and we say family members. But I really haven't talked much about, about the role of carers. And I think that it's, um, you know, we all of us are part of a, of, of a constellation of, of, of family networks where, where all of us, uh, you know, we have parents, we, have, we, we may have children, we have uh, uncles and aunts and nieces and nephews and cousins. And um, uh, so we're all of us embedded in, in, in family networks. And uh, uh, many people do end up uh, uh, at various times, uh, even as adults, living with their families because they, they are not, at this point, uh, living independently. Uh, and even if they are living independently, their families are there because we care about each other as, as human beings. So there are very important roles for, 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 uh, for family members uh, across the spectrum. First of all, I think family members need support for themselves. Uh, it's very difficult when you watch your uh, son or daughter or your husband or wife or whoever it is in your life not doing well, uh, suffering, and suffering in ways that, that often leads to a lot of, 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 uh, of lashing out and anger at the people who are closest to you and people who care about you. You know, the fact is if you're, if you're angry, at, let's take an example, out of mental health, you know, if, you're, if you have a job and you're angry at your boss and you can't yell at your boss because you'll lose your job, you come home and yell at your wife or your husband. So similarly, somebody who's undergoing a lot of emotional distress, instead of lashing out at, at, at uh, 
uh, whoever it is who might be making them angry or that they're having a difficult time with will come home and, and just, uh, you know, uh, give mom or dad a hard time. So it's very difficult sometimes to watch the person that you care about um, in an extreme state, and I think that, that, that carers need a lot of support for themselves. What, what, what do we do uh, when we see our relative um, not doing well and when they're yelling at us and when they're being difficult around the house and so forth? Uh, carers also um, need to become advocates for the services that, that, that their family member needs. So making sure that, that, that they're not just being uh, uh, shunted off, that they're not just being uh, uh, given a prescription and sent away, but, but that they're getting support, that they're getting practical help, that they're getting services that genuinely meet their needs. Um, and that uh, oftentimes it's important for, for the um, family, the, the carers, and, 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 and the uh, person who's experiencing distress to have an opportunity, maybe with a, um, a guide or referee of some sort, to discuss the issues at home that make it difficult uh, um, at home. So there are, I think there are, there are a lot of roles for carers, and uh, carers are a big part of um, helping to ensure that, that, that there's the, the range of services that people need. And also, I think carers can play a very big role in helping to overcome some of the stigma and discrimination. Uh, because you know that the person that you, you care about, well, maybe they're having a hard time, but they're not this dangerous uh, image that, that most people carry around with them that, that is perpetuated so much by, by the media. So that uh, uh, for uh, care, and I think that's a big project that carers and, and, and uh, people with, uh, with psychiatric labels can do together is to uh, do a genuine education around stigma and discrimination. I know in, in, in my country, a lot of what passes for anti-stigma education is totally controlled uh, by professionals, and it's, uh, I find, very, very stigmatizing. It's kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's that, uh, the emphasis is sort of, well, schizophrenics aren't dangerous. They're just very, very sick. Um, instead of being, well, people with schizophrenia are our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, and, uh, um, uh, let's see them in, as, they, as, as the full human beings they are. So I think that's, that there's a lot of roles uh, for carers to play. And I see a hand going back. Uh, can you expand on the difference between services appropriate for adults and services appropriate for kindergarten? Uh, well, what I was saying was that I think that a lot of services uh, that I've seen um, take people who are adults and treat them like they are little children. And I've gone into day programs where people are... Uh, uh, you know, coloring and uh, playing with clay, and uh, uh, you know, now it's fine if you're an artist and you want and you want to develop your artistic talent. But uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are uh, not particularly interested in in, in, uh, in coloring or you know, paper paint or stuff like that. And that's a lot of what goes on in a lot of day programs in the United States, certainly. Uh, so that I think uh, if we're if we're really genuinely going to uh, to help people before they're at the point of, 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 of working or even thinking about work, uh, to have activities during the day that are age appropriate and are appropriate to that person's own interests and needs. Not everybody should be doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, so that that's what I meant by, by talking about treating people like kindergartners. Any other questions? Judy. As a service goal, how would you distinguish between helping people Uh, I think they're related, but, but as was pointed out, they're, they're not quite the same thing. I think that in order for people to, um, to live as independently as possible, they need to, to feel empowered. I think that if you don't feel empowered, you're always feeling dependent on other people. You're always feeling like you, you can't make your own choices. You lack a sense of, of, of self-confidence. It doesn't mean that empowerment does not mean, let me make this perfectly clear, empowerment doesn't mean uh, that people never make mistakes or people never make bad choices because, uh, um, you know, beyond being people who can diagnose with serious mental illness, we're, we're human beings. And as human beings, we're notorious for making bad choices and, and, and doing stupid things from time to time. Um, so uh, I don't mean that, that a person has to uh, have a 100% you know, track record of always doing the right thing before they can go off and live independently, because then nobody would ever live independently. And I also think that it's important to look at what we uh, expect of people 
Um, as we move them on toward, towards more independent living, and I find that often, and again, I, I'm, I'm familiar with, with examples in the United States, so you'll have to tell me if this is the case here, but I can't imagine that it's all that much different. I find that very often that uh, service providers won't think that a person is ready for independent living unless they live up to a standard that's so high that they themselves probably couldn't meet it. Uh, I mean, people in group homes get penalized you know, for things like not making their beds. Um, and I always love to ask audiences of service providers, uh, you know, before you left the house this morning, did you make your bed? And, uh, or did you leave crumbs on your kitchen counters? Uh, or, um, you know, when was the last time you did your laundry? Uh, so that uh, um, moving people towards independent living, um, is, is, it doesn't mean that, that we're, we should have these, these, these artificially high expectations for people or else we deem that they're not ready. Uh, one of the best ways to help people live independently is to support them in independent living rather than moving them through a series of steps. Well, first you're going to live in a group home, and then you're going to live in a smaller group home, and then you're going to live in a supported apartment, and then we're going to move you on to, to independent living because the skills that you need to do each of those things are different. Um, one of the models that I really like a lot comes from New York City from a program called Housing First. Uh, which works with a very, very um, a difficult population. It's people who are um, diagnosed with a serious mental illness and who are homeless. And um, it's a group of people who um, also, um, almost by definition, have serious substance abuse problems. So this is a very, very hardcore population. And the traditional model of working with, with, with this population says that, that first we've got to get the person engaged in treatment. Then we've got to get them uh, off substances. Then we've got to get them, uh, teach them a whole series of skills. And then after they've achieved all those things, then we'll get them housing. And for people who are living, uh, uh, who are homeless, uh, for example, keeping appointments is very, very difficult. Uh, if you're homeless, you've got to think about um, where's a safe place for my stuff? Uh, where am I going to get food? Uh, where am I going to take a shower? Where am I going to use a bathroom? Um, and uh, um, you know, the fact that you've got an appointment at the clinic at 10 o'clock is probably not your highest priority, nor should it be if you're going to survive. So when you make people jump through a whole series of, how of hoops before you give them housing, very often they never reach that point. How housing First Use is a totally different model. What they do is take people directly off the streets who, who, who are willing to, uh, to work with them and get them into an apartment. And I've actually seen some videotapes where they take folks shopping. Uh, you know, you have to buy uh, what you were talking about earlier. You have to buy uh, furniture, you have to get furniture, and you have to, the, the, the one videotape was this guy trying to buy a telephone. Um, um, if you haven't had housing for many years, um, you know, the, just the idea that there's, you know, going to a store, there's 30 different telephones you can buy. He was just kind of overwhelmed, and, and uh, you know, with the, with the help of, of, of a worker, was picking out the telephone that he wanted in his apartment. Um, and then, once they get people into the housing, the goal there's two goals. One is helping them keep the housing, and the other is, at their own pace, getting them engaged in, 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 in the treatments and services that they need to improve their lives, which is usually uh, some kind of mental health treatment, some kind of substance abuse treatment, um, job training. Uh, counseling, a whole range of things, but getting them engaged in those things at their own pace and at their own request. And when people sometimes lose the housing because they can't uh, um, keep it clean enough, or they can't pay the rent, they don't, they you know go out and spend all their money, can't pay the rent, and things like that. What does housing first do? They get them another another apartment. And some people have been through three or four apartments before they kind of begin to count on the fact that they really do have housing, and they better start figuring out what they need to do to keep it. It's a fabulous model. It's, it's been researched. Uh, it's both cost effective and, uh, um, and effective on a human level, and yet the level of, of skepticism among professionals about it is, is very, very high. Um, so that uh, it's really possible to, uh, to help people to live independently by helping them to live independently and not by endlessly teaching them various kinds of skills that you will need to learn to live independently. It's a learn by doing approach. It gets people off the streets. It gets people feeling safe. It gives people a stake in their own empowerment and recovery because they now have something that they really want to preserve and they really want to keep. Um, and there's been a lot written about it. Uh, you can, um, 
Um, you can do a, an internet search, I'm sure, and find lots and lots of, 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 uh, of the research about the model. But it's, uh, to me, it's, 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 it just makes perfect sense. Um, and yet it flies in the face. And it's like, it's, it's like uh, again, what you were showing us earlier, where you said the circle goes this way, but you know, it should go this way. So people are, and, and I'll quote from another, all my, all my activist friends are dead. It's very sad. I'll quote from another wonderful um, um, uh, founder of, of, of the, um, uh, the clients movement. Uh, called, he was, his name was Howie Gell, but he was called Howie the Hart because he was uh, lived on the streets homeless in many years, for many years and, and in New York City, played the harmonica for money. Um, and Howie, Howie Hart used to, he, he was a, a homeless activist. Um, and he used to say that, uh, you know, there's a problem. Homeless people, they don't have housing. Give them housing. End of problem. <laughs> but, and, um, as a matter of fact, Howie and I were, were, were engaged in a, uh, as consultants to a uh, homeless uh, a research project in, in uh, Boston some years ago to give, give homeless people uh, um, housing. They were looking at two different housing models. It was a fabulously well-financed study because not only were they providing the housing, it was very good housing, very nice housing, uh, but they were studying these people intensively. They had psychiatrists, they had psychologists, they had anthropologists, they had so, uh, social workers. They, and in order to get this housing, all you had to do, do was to agree to undergo a whole lot of periodic interviews for which people were being paid. But still, it was you know, a, lot of, a lot of questionnaires, you know, three months down the line, six months down the line, etc. And um, we were the consultants coming in to, to evaluate how they were doing, how the, how the professionals were doing in, in the program, not how the, how the clients were doing. But as, in, in part, as part of it, we met with, with some of the clients, and one woman said to us, I don't understand this project. She said, it's a great project, because I've got great housing now, and I really like it. And I was homeless before, and, uh, and you know, that was pretty awful. But she said, I really don't understand. She said, what are all these, these psychiatrists and psychologists and anthropologists and all these other people doing with all this money? Uh, why do they need to, you know, do all the studying to find out that it's better to have a home than to be homeless? <laughs> and what we decided uh, among the consultants and, and, and her was that, that, that the homeless people are very smart. They know what they need. It's the professionals who have to be educated. <laughs> So on that note, unless there's more questions, okay. Can I pick up again about this, this day services issue and moving away from those activities and maybe give us a few more examples of the states of activities that take place in the place? Because I think sometimes in the UK what we tend to do, we tend to get a good idea that we can just say and say, and we tend not to follow it through, and it, the, the information gets lost. And some of the stuff I work with at the moment, I sit there a lot of the time going, we were doing this four or five years ago, and it'd be interesting to see what other activities you engage with. Well, I think the biggest thing is to get away from the idea that everybody does everything the same. You know, rather than a day program where we have, you know, we have, oh, uh, you know, the painting group in the morning and the bingo group in the afternoon, is 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 that people are engaged in in a, uh, and I'll talk more about recovery plans in the afternoon. But people are engaged in in their own recovery plans, figuring out and implementing what things they need, uh, so that somebody who, for example, wants to. Uh, um, go back to, uh, to get a university degree, let's say. An awful lot of people get diagnosed with schizophrenia when they're in the middle of their, their uh, university studies. Uh, and they you know, want to go back and complete it. Well, they might need to be um, doing some preparatory work towards that. Um, learning you know, study skills. Uh, learning some stress management skills. Uh, another person might uh, uh, be in the process of figuring out, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to, uh, what kind of career do I want? What kind of training do I, do I need to get that career? Another person may be uh, um, uh, saying, you know, I need to improve my personal hygiene or my personal uh, uh, living habits in order to live successfully. Maybe engage in various uh, skill building kinds of things. So it's not so much every, it's not so much replacing one kind of group with another kind of group. It's in moving towards a much more individualized model in which people are working towards their own goals and constantly redefining their goals and maybe even changing their goals. Because uh, another question I love to ask audiences of professionals are how many people are working uh, in the field that you were originally trained for? So that you know, people change their minds and, and people may, in the middle of, of studying to be a, a dog groomer, may decide, gee, I don't think I really want to be a dog, dog groomer and be around animals all day. And, uh, you know, so, so people may, maybe in, 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 in the course of, of going, through, um, going through their recovery plan, may, may change course.